Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Len Calabrese, and I would uh, like to welcome you to this uh, symposia on patient-centered management of spondyloarthropathies. Today, um, I'm going to start out with a little bit of historical overview of this interesting disease. Um, and I'm going to dwell on the issue of uh, diagnosis and etiology. Uh, Elaine is going to pivot and talk about, actually, once the diagnosis is made, what is our office approach and what's the management? And hopefully we will um, encompass some of the controversies today in trying to define uh, this disease, particularly at its earliest stages. So, as always, uh, today uh, we talk about this disease uh, from a molecular perspective. Uh, and I'd like to give a very brief overview of this uh, 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 from a historical perspective because it gives us some grounding. I'd like to say this is from paleontology to molecular biology. I'm going to divide it into a few phases, um, uh, starting um, uh, uh, with the pharaohs and up to the discovery of HLA-B27. So I gave a variation of this talk last year at ACR, and I did a kind of an informal survey. And I asked uh, many rheumatologists um, whether, uh, uh, what is the earliest example of ankylosing spondylitis? And the majority of people that I talked to said that it was well documented in the pharaohs, uh, in the mummies uh, artifacts um, uh, that have been studied extensively over the past century and a half. Um, so... As a starting point, I, I will assert that this is probably not true. Um, uh, and uh, I'll just give you the, the 30,000 foot view of why this is. So it has been uh, stated widely in the literature in many textbooks and a few articles um, that uh, particularly Ramses II and his son, uh, uh, Marenpa, uh, had ankylosing spondylitis. This is based upon examination of these uh, uh, remains of these uh, mummies uh, and these x-rays, which to me look pretty compelling as somebody that has spondylitis. Um, I think that you can kind of see this, uh, what looks like a bamboo spine here. You can't really see much in the way of sacroiliac joints. Um, um, the, the neck is a little less compelling. You see kind of a uh, more of a horizontal osteophyte here. But still, uh, nevertheless, uh, this uh, looks fairly compelling. This was a very uh, prominent article um, by a Canadian group. Senior author on this was Tony Russell. Um, following the publication of this, uh, there were uh, several investigators, including Shem, who is, uh, has written a textbook on paleoradiology. So this is uh, obviously a rather small subset uh, and subspecialty, uh, but there are people in radiology who have studied um, artifacts of um, uh, uh, mummified remains. And they make a very, very strong case uh, that m most of what was seen and described um, in the original papers were artifactual. Uh, first of all, the sacroiliac joints were not taken in an AP film the way that we want them. They're taken PA. Uh, secondly, the um, uh, 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 areas that look so much like um, a bamboo spine are actually artifacts because there's no more fat and this is outlined by air. Um, furthermore, um, studying some of the uh, 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 principal, uh, the probands in this study. Uh, this is a, uh, an, uh, an excellent description of Ramses, who was supposedly in his 30s uh, at the, the Battle of Luxor. Here we are in Las Vegas. I think it's the other Luxor, but I'm just going to go out on a limb on that one. Um, it said uh, uh, he was in his 30s, and it said at this battle, he had a way of standing and attacking um, uh, uh, his Majesty actually did it twice in the presence of his troops um, and chariots. Uh, his Majesty took up the coat of mail and wear it, uh, to wear it and spent two hours attacking the city of the Hittite foe. So uh, inferential uh, data. He didn't sound like a guy with very bad ankylosing spondylitis. So the, uh, the preponderance of data here is that um, pr 
probably uh, not a disease that was well documented in the pharaohs. The first um, real anatomic description of this um, uh, agreed upon by all historians was uh, Bernard Connor, an Irish physician um, who um, uh, went to work in France, exhumed a skeleton that has been widely described um, and written about um, uh, that uh, has all the trappings pathologic of ankylosing spondylitis. But this wasn't a clinical description. Exhumed the skeleton, said, you know, this looks like a disease that we have not seen before, um, uh, and this stands as the uh, original anatomic description. The real first clinical descriptions of this disease date back really to the 19th century, and all of these uh, emanated from Great Britain. Um, uh, they were all very good descriptions of young people um, with advancing ankylosing spondylitis, particularly one by Dr. Uh, Sir Benjamin Brody, who most rheumatologists know uh, wrote one of the first influential uh, rheumatology texts, The Diseases of Joints. Um, yet very little in the way of insights uh, were attracted from this. The, the neo-modern history of ankylosing spondylitis really stems to these uh, eponymous uh, uh, origins um, of, uh, uh, of Vladimir Bechtero uh, from uh, Leningrad, uh, Adolf Schrompel um, from Vienna, and uh, Pierre Marie, of course, from Paris. And at the end of the 19th century, all of them wrote about this. And um, if we look at older textbooks of uh, rheumatology, you'll see this called as... Uh, you know, Marie Strompel or uh, Spondylitis uh, von Bechtero. Um, all of them were pretty close in describing what we uh, currently recognize as this. They certainly described peripheral arthritis. They described the uh, spondylitic involvement of the spine. Uh, Bechtero actually described a, a very bizarre kind of uh, neuropathic component to this kind of hard to assume, but collectively, and actually several reports from each author's um, uh, really capture the essence of what we now call classical ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, I was particularly interested when I did this um, little uh, bit of historical research as to what uh, the great Sir William Osler had to say about this. So if we look at his first textbook of medicine, uh, 1892, The Principles and Practice of Medicine, the greatest textbook to exist for 35 years. Um, he really did not nail this disease with the um, prescience uh, that he had for so many other diseases. He uh, clearly recognized a form of spondylitis uh, that made the spine uh, virtually impossible to uh, bend, and I think that he... Um, uh, was referring to ankylosing spondylitis. He uh, critically appraised the literature from uh, Marie Strompel and Bechtero um, um, and uh, noted that he had seen this in his practice. But uh, I think fatally, he said the, he thought that they were mere uh, uh, variants of arthritis deformants, which is clearly talking about uh, degenerative or osteoarthritis of the spine. So um, uh, and this uh, was noted in the seventh edition, uh, which was the last uh, edition of his textbook, where he was the sole author. After that, he had many um, editors with him. So um, I, I don't uh, give Osler great credit for this. But the modern era of this uh, moves rapidly forward uh, with the advent of radiography, uh, there were, in the end of the 19th century, there were several examples of post-mortem uh, 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 reports of the classic bamboo spine. Uh, but it wasn't until the early, early 20th century um, that uh, Schleyer uh, described um, in a living person um, a classic involvement of the spine, um, and reports uh, continued to um, proliferate. This is an article which I think is of particular interest in defining this disease. And this is by Jacques Forestier, uh, who has done, uh, did so much to help us uh, understand disease of the spine, um, uh, where he drew attention to the fact that in what they called ankylosing spondylitis, and I think this is really interesting because when we get into our talk in just a couple minutes, 
Um, this is now the fully developed and end stages of this disease. Um, all had radiographic evidence of sacroiliitis, or at least 98% um, in this landmark study. Um, from that point on through the 30s, 40s, 50s, um, many of the extra articular manifestations were defined, including uh, aortitis, ocular disease, relationship to inflammatory bowel disease. Um, but in my era, in my era of uh, training in rheumatology in the late 70s, there was still a thread of uh, nomenclature that referred to ankylosing spondylitis as rheumatoid spondylitis. And uh, my chief uh, would refer to this as rheumatoid spondylitis. And it was actually not until 1963 uh, that the um, ACR, uh, at that time the American, Rheumatoid, uh, American Rheumatism Association, formally designated ankylosing spondylitis as a distinct uh, nosologic entity. Uh, so people that were holdovers from that era uh, were still not totally convinced because there are people with spondylitis that had you know, a lot of peripheral uh, uh, synovitis that looked like rheumatoid. Um, uh, it led to confusion. So the final chapter is known by everyone. And this is the, the omega of paleontology. This is the molecular biology. And there's a story here, uh, of course, to be told. Um, it was 1973 that two groups working in parallel, um, uh, Brewerton and London, uh, Lee Schlostein was uh, the uh, fellow uh, working in the laboratory of Paul Terasaki um, at UCLA. Rodney Bluestone was the uh, senior um, rheumatologist at the time. Um, uh, both of them uh, studying genetic markers and disease. Uh, People in our field, uh, many of them recognized that the disease that they were studying for genetics was gout. It has familial tendencies. And ankylosing spondylitis was the control group in this. And lo and behold, uh, the identification of over 90% of the people in the control group having a single allele uh, of a class II um, locus of HLA, uh, namely B27, uh, was tectonic, uh, and it took many years to find uh, a disease um, that um, uh, could even um, uh, uh, come close to that in terms of a disease association. Uh, both of these groups published within months of each other, and there's a whole other story uh, to be told. So with that run-up, now we confront the disease uh, that we... Uh, 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 heretofore had called ankylosing spondylitis, and now we call it uh, spondyloarthropathy, ankylosing spondylitis being a variant of that. So I'm going to talk about the classification, the concept of SPA, um, why it uh, takes time to diagnose it, and what criteria that most of us should be using, and why um, there is this gap of uh, patients that we believe have the disease and those patients that are under um, treatment. So I'll be talking about classification criteria and diagnostic criteria. Everybody knows that this is a, you know, this is a tradi traditional conundrum. Um, we have many classification criteria. The, the classification criteria are generally used in clinical trials. We want to have homogeneity of, uh, of uh, our subjects uh, to try out a, a diagnostic tool or a therapeutic tool. Uh, so we uh, establish criteria. Um, all of us, all of us are guilty, uh, and not really guilty of anything, but we all use criteria that have been used for classification in the diagnostic process. Diagnostic process um, is much, much different. Uh, we have to have that level of diagnostic certainty that gives us therapeutic certainty. You know, a diagnosis, there's only three levels of certainty that we actually have to deal with. I know what it is, and I'll treat it. I know what it's not, and I'll rule it out, or I need more data. Um, so there is a close relationship between classification and diagnostic criteria because uh, we often use one to derive the other. So this is the old uh, view of ankylosing spondylitis as the central disease 
um, with many related conditions, including psoriatic arthritis, IBD-associated arthritis, kind of undifferentiated forms, juvenile forms, and uh, what we used to call writer's disease, we now call reactive arthritis. I will show you a more nuanced version of this based upon uh, how we look at this. These are the tools that we use in the diagnostic process of SPA, um, and that uh, has to do with our clinical findings, and that may be um, uh, our evaluation of back pain. It may be our evaluation of peripheral arthritis. It may be the patient that shows up um, uh, it to the ophthalmologist with non-granulomatous anterior uveitis. It may be someone in the dermatologist's office with psoriasis or uh, presenting uh, to a, a PCP or a gastroenterologist with what turns out to be some spectrum of uh, inflammatory bowel disease. This is then coupled um, with some form of imaging and uh, we are now in the era of MR, and we'll spend some time talking about this. And then we have adjuncts to help us in this process, and that is laboratory markers, um, uh, genetic um, um, and uh, uh, other markers, including acute phase reactants. We'll talk about how we use them in a minute. So now, fast forward this just a bit, and this is really our more nuanced view of SPA. Um, so here we have ankylosing spondylitis, but it no longer has it quite as central a position. We have this large group of undifferentiated SPA that we'll talk about, and then we have this nuanced relationship between uh, skin, bowel, um, and infections of uh, mucosal sites. Um, how does this all go together? How did we get here? Um, let's start with our model, and I will, I will try to prove to you and sophisticated audience of people that you understand uh, where this comes from. Um, this is the evolution of SPA as we uh, uh, believe that we have it today. And those pictures that I showed you from Jacques Forestier to uh, Bernard Connor, these are people over here who have end-stage ankylosing spondylitis. Easy to recognize. You see the person walking down the street. Um, that's what they have. At the other end of the spectrum are people with back pain um, that are in the earliest stages of developing spondyloarthropathy. Um, clearly, many of them, and we'll talk about some numbers in a little bit, will have normal plain films of the spine. At some point in time, they uh, have uh, uh, normal MRs of the spine. There has to be a stage uh, where that's seen. But soon, sooner rather than later, the MR becomes abnormal, and now we have criteria to recognize um, um, uh, uh, sacroiliitis and spondylitis on MR in advance of this. Only when um, back pain and radiographic um, uh, uh, abnormalities are present did we meet uh, those criteria of just 25 years ago um, uh, and now we have a, a, a much uh, uh, more um, uh, nuanced spectrum of disease. So let's uh, take this apart a little bit. A couple principles. Here we have um, uh, the onset of symptoms um, and the onset of diagnosis. And as you can see, these curves have the same shape, but they are displaced in time by about five to nine years. Many people, uh, young people before the age of 45 who develop SPA, this spectrum that encompasses all of these diseases, um, will have um, an onset uh, of some peripheral symptom, back pain, peripheral arthritis, extra articular manifestation, and it takes time to bring them into this level of diagnostic certainty. I think there are many reasons for that, and I'm going to point them out to you. Um, as we go along, uh, but our challenge as um, consultants is to close this gap. Uh, this is not uh, necessary if we're thinking about this. What's the influence of this genetic marker that we talked about? Well, if, you know, 90% plus of people with ankylosing spondylitis have B27 and a very high level ha of SPA spectrum have it, um, are they all the same? And the answer is no. Um, 
Here are um, uh, uh, men uh, on the left and women on the right broken down for B27 positive or B27 negative. And what you see is this tendency for B27 uh, uh, positive people, whether they're men or women, to be left shifted. If you're B27 positive and you have SPA, these are the characteristics that you have. You tend to be younger at onset, both of symptoms and diagnosis. Um, because of that, you're more likely to have this diagnosis made at an earlier age. It's kind of common sense that you're more likely to have um, uh, a greater familial occurrence on uh, family history taking, also more likely to have certain extra spinal manifestations, uh, such as anterior uveitis, but less um, prone uh, to have uh, psoriasis and IBD is probably because of some genetic partitioning because so many more uh, genes at risk um, uh, will, will surface um, in these uh, related but uh, not identical conditions. Now, I, I thought Dr. Khan was going to be here today, and I don't see him in the audience, and I wanted to show this uh, slide for his um, for him in particular, this is part of the ASAS slide set. I'll be using many of the slides from ASAS, and I give them great, great credit. Uh, they've posted several hundred slides on the, um, uh, uh, on the web that any of you can download and use in a presentation that is for educational purposes such as this. And what you're looking at here are two things. One, this is a map of the world looking at the subarctic um, propensity for HLA B27. This is percentages of populations who are B27 positive. And as you can see, starting at the Arctic <clears throat> and then going south, it diminishes greatly. Up in the upper left-hand corner, you see Dr. Mohammed Asim Khan's uh, license plate, um, um, the Ohio HLA B27, which he's had for about 25 years. I always tell him, he's HLA B27 Ohio, I'm T-cell Ohio. So we have, we have the market cornered in, in there. Um, why this uh, subarctic uh, distribution is uh, such is really uh, poorly understood, um, but the uh, occurrence of this in Nordic families uh, is um, uh, well known. Uh, if you look at the distribution of B27 among populations, you'll see that those that have the highest um, um, uh, 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 prevalence of B27, such as some indigenous populations, will have very, very high rates of ankylosing spondylitis, almost one in uh, 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 20 uh, people or more. So having said that about the genetic background, let's now look at the, uh, the current uh, kind of uh, vogue topic of inflammatory back pain to ankylosing spondylitis. It is remarkable to me uh, that, you know, when people think in a clarion fashion that you can come up with great concepts um, of great utility. And Andre Callan, when he was um, working at Stanford, had an idea um, uh, that they could uh, separate out people with, uh, at that time, was really ankylosing spondylitis from this huge population of people with back pain. Um, if they use targeted questions, and they approach this in a Bayesian fashion, you know, what is the sensitivity, what is the specificity, when you apply it to a patient uh, population of known prevalence, how can you do this? And they um, uh, took uh, this landmark paper published um, in the late 70s, which I quote every single time I talk to fellows or students about back pain. Um, they took a very pristine group of uh, B27 positive AS patients, they took about 20 patients uh, with normal SI films in the uh, orthopedic uh, clinic for back pain, and then they took some healthy controls, and they asked them a bunch of questions, and this is what they found. If you had this back pain occur before the age of 40, if it was chronic, uh, but insidious onset, didn't come you know, while you're out you know, doing uh, yard work, um, had the features of being improved by exercise, um, and uh, accentuated in the morning. If you had four out of five of these, you had a 95% sensitivity of having ankylosing spondylitis and an 85% specificity. 
Well, that's just, you can ask these questions in a minute. Um, If you compare that to ordering an HLA B27, which at that time was a very exotic test, um, uh, uh, which had a sensitivity of about 90 to 95%, but was woefully nonspecific, we know that in B27 populations, about one out of five or six will have uh, spondylitis. Um, it, It, you know, beat the heck out of it. If you had all five, well, you, you walk away with a 97% specificity, um, but you compromise its sensitivity. Uh, I thought it was a defining moment um, in a Bayesian approach to medicine. Many people, uh, this is what I call dancing on the head of a pin, um, many people have tried to refine these criteria. Say, you know, getting better with non-steroidals, uh, saying not getting better with exercise. Uh, these are all variations. Um, uh, and they have defined what many people call inflammatory back pain. And uh, this is uh, our, our standard tool. These are the questions that define it. It's kind of a tautologic uh, phenomena because inflammatory back pain is the clinical picture that people with SPA have. And as a consequence, we define SPA by the presence of those signs and symptoms that uh, define the population. Uh, yet, at the same token, it has both uh, face validity and content validity as proven by these studies. So let's apply it to a, a patient population. This is in Haines. This is a public health population. Uh, Michael Weissman um, and uh, John Ravel uh, did a sub-study uh, of about 5,000 patients of the in Haines study and uh, applied uh, a rigorous uh, uh, criteria uh, body surface mapping, uh, a number of techniques to figure out how many people have inflammatory back pain, how many people have spa. And uh, what they found was not that uh, you would be at the least surprised, and if you took a poll in this room, how many people have, have you know, recurrent or chronic back pain, it's about one in five. Um, they found about five or six percent of the time it fits somebody's definition of inflammatory back pain. And they found very close to previous estimates that about 1% of patients had some head spa by an established criteria. So interesting, 20% of people with back pain, 5% of people with inflammatory back pain, 1% of people with spa. So if we now look at our, our, our model over here, well, 1% of people with spa is somewhere to the right of the dotted line. People with inflammatory back pain are somewhere over here, and then people with back pain in general over here. If you think about this critically for a minute, you're going to ask a question of, you know, well, where are all the people between inflammatory back pain and ankylosing spondylitis? Because if it's true, these data are true, that there's one, one and a half percent of patients, uh, uh, population with ankylosing spondylitis, where are they? In a rheumatologist's office, we have far, far less patients with spa than we do with rheumatoid. So um, this is what we're going to talk about. So there is a stage we now recognize quite well. We call it pre-radiographic axial spondyloarthropathy. So that is um, this disease over here um, before the x-ray turns abnormal. Um, And um, what does that mean? Well, these people don't meet the old criteria that required x-rays, but Everything about them is spondyloarthropathy-like. They have the same compromised quality of life. They respond to treatment virtually uh, in a similar fashion to patients with ankylosing spondylitis. You know, you give a patient with mechanical back pain uh, Enbrel, uh, nothing happens. Um, uh, and that's been actually demonstrated. Um, these people respond uh, dramatically like spa patients. Um, even though those drugs are not approved uh, for the use in, in, in this uh, pre-radiographic stage at the present time. Um, about 12% of these people over a course of a year will um, meet criteria for SPA, and about 70% of them over a lifetime. So these are really important people, and um, this is where we want to focus on. This is a study that I just want to focus on one figure over here. This is the modified New York criteria for ankylosing spondylitis that requires x-rays. This is a study very recently published just in the last um, few months 
um, looking at the rheumatologist uh, diagnosis as the gold standard. And 65 patients with axial spa, only 16% of them had abnormal uh, plane films. That means that if you're waiting for an x-ray to be positive, um, you're, you're missing a lot of these uh, patients with spa spectrum diseases. So this is the way I, I, I paint this picture now. There's 20% of the people out there that have chronic back pain. 5% of them uh, will have, of, uh, of the population, uh, of this population, will have uh, spa. Uh, it's about 1% of the overall population. About 5% to 6% of the overall population has um, inflammatory back pain. But this, this is enriched. 12 to 14% will have spa in a year, 70% over a lifetime. Um, of those with this non-radiographic uh, spa, these are the people that we want to find. So where, where are the patients dropping out? Um, I believe, and, and I, I don't consider myself really an expert in spa, but... Um, uh, most of these patients are seeing primary care physicians. They're in occupational medicine. Um, many other countries, such as Germany and the Netherlands, have developed flow-through care pathways. If you're less than 45 and you have uh, chronic back pain, go see a rheumatologist. That's the answer to sorting this out. Let them sort this out. And I actually believe that that's probably a better algorithm than trying to meet three or four or five um, it warrants it. Not yet. Insidious onset back pain that's chronic in a young person, they should have this evaluation. So this is just published last month um, in the Rheumatologist, uh, the publication of the, uh, of the college. This is by Atul Diodar, and I love this, uh, this analogy. This is his kind, of, uh, his, his kind of view of the world of the spectrum of spa, this kind of uh, stream it starts somewhere up here uh, in, in the locks um, that uh, these are genetically predisposed patients and they get some kind of chronic back pain that has inflammatory features. Well, some of them, you know, it might go away. It might go away for months to years. But over time, uh, many of these patients will develop, you know, starting with quiescent to then full-blown disease. Some of them will take a track of non-radiographic progression and others um, uh, will develop full-blown ankylosing spondylitis. So it's a good way of thinking about it. It's a very nice review. So where are all these other patients? I've already mentioned in my mind uh, where we think they are. Um, uh, so let's just close by talking about the x-rays. This is the old x-rays. It required you to have a, uh, abnormal plane films. Um, uh, uh, what is an abnormal plane film? Um, uh, I'll show you in a minute. These are the new criteria. If you take anything out of this uh, talk, this is the single slide that we need to think about. This is the ACES classification for SPA. That is what we use. Um, it has two big compartments. Those people presenting with back pain under the age of 45 and those people with peripheral SPA. That means uveitis, inflammatory bowel disease, psoriasis, dactylitis, etc. If you're in the back pain group, um, you, either, you have a, 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 a normal x-ray, um, you get sacroiliitis on imaging, and all you need is one more feature, and you are in you are spa. If you don't have back pain, then you need some more of these clinical features. I, these are uh, available uh, in your handouts. Um, this is really the stock and trade. Um, uh, using these criteria, they have a very good sensitivity and specificity. Um, let me just tell you now about a couple of the nuances. Um, everybody could recognize an abnormal um, AP film of the pelvis when it looks like this. You see this sclerosis, widening of the joint. Um, uh, this looks like there's some fusion over here. This is a no-brainer. This is a normal sacroiliac joint. Um, and this is pretty easy to detect uh, as well. Um, this is a grade one out of four um, abnormal sacroiliac uh, film. This is, um, n this is not adequate for modified New York criteria. Uh, this would probably be grade two for Dr. Kahn um, because he's so much more astute of eye than the rest of us. Um, but uh, as you can see, this is probably not normal over here. You have a little bit of sclerosis, but many radiologists might walk right by this. So this is too difficult uh, for the generalist or non-bone 
um, a base radiologist to pick up at this stage. If the film is read as normal, um, uh, MR imaging of the sacroiliac joints is warranted. We now have criteria for these. It requires um, uh, the use of two sequences, uh, STIR images, which are fat suppressed, and T1 images, which show inflammation. Um, the criteria that we're looking for is the presence of definite bone edema in multiple sequences. That's really the, 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 the primary finding. It is enhanced when you have erosions and synovitis as well. Let me just show you a couple pictures here. This is a young uh, person that's had uh, really symptoms since the age of eight with peripheral arthritis, um, then enthesitis, and at the age of 18 finally comes to have um, uh, an MR. Um, they have normal plain films of the back, and as you can see, this white stuff on stir images, this is bone edema, bone edema, bone edema. So you have multiple cuts, multiple areas of bone edema. Um, this patient has uh, pre-radiographic um, axial spa. And uh, this patient should be treated and treated aggressively, as Dr. Husney is going to point out. Um, you don't need gadolinium for this. This is a T1 image, and here you can see uh, frank synovitis here, and here you see this kind of shaggy border. There's some erosion with synovitis. This is all you need to do. So, um, just to make the point that not everything that is a bone edema um, and synovitis is ankylosing spondylitis. Here you see this obliterated anatomic borders. You can actually see it going into the sacrum. This is someone with a, a septic uh, sacroiliac joint. Um, and finally, there are findings that are beyond uh, the, the scope of this talk uh, in the spine, uh, but they have to do with on T1 imaging, you can see uh, this um, uh, fatty degeneration of the corners of the vertebrae. On stir images, you can actually see rarefaction. This is a more advanced image. And here's gadolinium, and I said you do not need gadolinium for this, but you can actually see that these enhance, um, and this is inflammation. So the, the, the screening for SPA goes something like this. If a patient has chronic back pain for greater than three months and they're under age 45, um, uh, Ask the questions. Do they have inflammatory back pain or do they not? If they have inflammatory back pain, you know, it's insidious onset, worse in the morning, gets better with exercise. Um, uh, uh, they are at very high risk uh, for this. If they had a plain film um, uh, that was abnormal, it's a very simple diagnosis. Most of them, if you're seeing them early, will have uh, normal films. Um, MR imaging. Um, if um, uh, uh, it has the findings that we talked about of uh, multiple areas of bone edema, uh, hopefully with some evidence of synovitis, um, this is pre-radiographic axial spa. Um, on the other hand, um, uh, if this is normal, you can go the B27 route, uh, which adds to the diagnostic um, uh, specificity, um, uh, particularly in the presence of extra spinal manifestations. All of these end down here with refer to a rheumatologist because sometimes uh, clinical acumen um, will put people into that um, uh, last category. So I've kind of set the table here uh, for how to think about back pain, um, how to triage people with chronic back pain, how to secure that diagnosis of SPA, how to divide it into pre-radiographic um, uh, and radiographic stages. Um, but now we need to know uh, what to do with these people. So I'm going to welcome Elaine Husney up here, and she's going to walk us through some of the cool stuff going on on the treatment of SPA.